picking Bob Dylan's top 10 albums was for the most part a simple task. In fact, a tediously simple task. One that would involve your humble narrator simply regurgitating what was fundamentally a whole bunch of other people's opinions which he happened to share. Then it occurred to me why not test how accurate that last statement was. So I took 36 Bob Dylan albums ranked items off the internet and aggregated a ranking order from that list. Then I thought, let's compare it to how the one I made for this series, making it in effect list number 37, and see how axiomatic that top 10 ranking was. Let's begin. Number 10, Oh Mercy. Oh Mercy represents not only a rebirth of creative energy so great it represented a monumental career revival, but that it required another monumental career revival to restore Dylan to the heights to which it elevated his reputation. Full of simple, heartfelt songs set alight by Dan Lanois' hitherto unheard production devices, the album emphatically broke a streak of seven albums, if you count the noble shot of love, that had effectively trashed Dylan's critical reputation. Songs like Most of the Time, Where Teardrops Fall, Ring Them Bells, which is a masterpiece in my opinion, and the Leonard Cohen-esque A Man in the Long Black Coat are more than enough, if not to restore that critical reputation, to at least remind us of it. Number nine, Slow Train Coming. Slow Train Coming is one of the most inscrutable work in Dylan's catalogue. While no one seems to doubt or dare contradict the established story that this is Dylan's chronicle of his first full flush of Christian fervor, it still bears some striking similarities to the songs of Street Legal, just better thought through narratively and much better sounding. Some of the rancor of Street Legal remains disguised as holy fury, in Slow Train and the Lusty Change My Way of Thinking, or the elliptical storytelling of Precious Angel, whereas the undoubted sincerity of I Believe in You and When He Returns, the latter perhaps more so than the former. To find a record for what it is. There's even flashes of humour in Man Gave Names to All the Animals, or the You Can Call Me Barbie, You Can Call Me Zimmy, and the kind of apocalyptic apocrypha when he sings of mercy on their bone-filled graves that has sustained albums from time out of mind forward. An album too unfairly rated as a curiosity, it stands on its own as some of the best work Dylan has ever produced. Number eight, John Wesley Harding. John Wesley Harding, 1967's knotty parables of bad men, lost men, desperate men, visionary men, lovelorn men, and mad prophets, was as far from what the mainstream was in December 1967 as it was far from Dylan's last album, Blonde on Blonde. But The Good Will Out and the album's most celebrated song, All Along the Watchtower, became, six months later in the hands of Jimi Hendrix, what the mainstream was. But there's far more to John Wesley Harding than just Watchtower. The beautiful I Dreamed I Saw St. Augustine, Drifter's Escape, The Brilliant Wicked Messenger, I Pity the Poor Immigrant, and the Closing Country Couplet of Down Along the Cove and I'll Be Your Baby Tonight. Make this not only a must-own Dylan album, but a must-own album, period. Number seven, Love and Theft. To my mind, the best album from his late career resurgence. Love and Theft gleefully plunders from the American musical experience of the 20th century, from the thumping rock and roll of Tweedly Dum and Tweedly Dee and Honest With Me, through the heartbreaking country of Mississippi, the big band ebullience of Summer Days, the lazy country blues of Floater, the delta intensity of High Water, the parlor jazz of By and By, his best vocal in over 20 years on Moonlight, and the hard Chicago sounds of Lonesome Day Blues. It's also, for those who care about these things, his strongest set of lyrics in an age. You can always come back, but you can't come back all the way, he sings. But Love and Theft disproves this. She said, you can't repeat the past. What do you mean you can't? Of course you can, he sings in Summer Days. And Love and Theft vindicates this utterly. 
It is a thrill a minute fun ride in turns heartbreaking and hilarious. I'm sitting on my watch so I'll be on time. There's not a single song you don't want to sing or play along to. To me it is far superior to Time Out of Mind. Number six, Another Side of Bob Dylan. Recorded in a single Beaujolais slosh night representing the high point of Dylan's 1960s songcraft. He became a better record maker, no doubt. The worse for drink vocals on another side are a little painful in points, but for pure thrilling song crafts, it's hard to better. Chimes of Freedom, My Back Pages, I Don't Believe You, Spanish Harlem Incident, To Ramona, or Motor Psycho Nightmare as beacons of the 1960s as I wish they were. Number five, The Free Wheel and Bob Dylan. And thus we enter that hall of albums which are indispensable in any collection. One poll had this as Dylan's best and for the pure fame of his songs, there's a case to be had. A stunning survey of Dylan's world through the winter and spring of 1962, it encompasses the widest disparity of songs on any Dylan album. Side one and the first half of side two are brilliant songs on which huge chunks of the 1960s were built blowing in the wind a hard rain's gonna fall girl of the north country don't think twice it's all right masters of war which i don't like myself but i have to concede bob dylan's dreams oxford town and the portentous bob dylan's blues but the final songs are throwaways and should have been thrown away accordingly especially seeing the Rye and excellent Let Me Die in My Footsteps was led off the album. Number four, Blood on the Tracks. Regardless of its theme, and remember Dylan was far from blameless in matters of his divorce, here we have an album almost full of wonderful songs, Lily Rosemary and the Jack of Hearts is entertaining but no more than a diversion, that explore the human condition far beyond the tawdry confines of two people turning away from each other and only one side of a story being told. The rightly famous Tangled Up in Blue explores Dylan's mastery of masks and of temporal manipulation, flitting in between time, place and character to write legends of women in his life who were as close behind as the past, still clinging onto his memory with snares real and imagined. The protagonist of Simple Twist of Fate may be one of the masked characters in Tangled Up in Blue. Dylan protests you're a big girl now isn't about Sarah and him. If not, it's a masterpiece as the songwriter is novelist. Deny as he might, it's irresistible to see Idiot Wind as anything but a cosmic call to judgment on Sarah and him. No answer blows in this wind, only dissolution and doom. You're gonna make me lonesome when you go is slight and disarming as it is, but it does contain my favorite Dylan lyric anywhere. But I see you in the sky above, in the tall grass and the ones I love. Side two remits only slightly in quality. Lily Rosemary and the Jack of Hearts is a funny and engaging piece, but no more. If you see her say hello has a quiet dignity and pools of sadness. And Buckets of Rain, the sparse but optimistic closer, which is my favorite on the album where Dylan finds the greatest power in his simple lines and rolling, playful melody. That leaves us shelter from the storm, another byway on the road song that Tangled Up in Blue maps out. Desperate fate, a bargain of salvation, self-inflicted wounds, betrayal, an irredeemable loss, a modern retelling of a 14th century mystery play, one of his most enduringly popular songs. Blood on the Tracks is a complete album, whole and fully realised and it remains the album that each Dylan reviewer, choking on paroxysms of praise, says the current album is the best since. And they're right, there has been nothing better since. Number three, bringing it all back home. Some say rock music and rock and roll departed from one another at this point. It's a tempting point to yield, but it isn't true. 
What happened here was rock music having stood on the shoulder of giants. It was this album that saw beyond the horizon of the 12 inch disc into wider society, wider social thinking, wider possibilities for and expectations from the audience. Suddenly everyone had different stories to tell, different ways to relate to their audience and say it softly unless those British bad boys the Rolling Stones hear you, had to rock harder. Side one is an electric revelation, raucous, irreverent, manic and earthquaking. But it's the acoustic side, side two, that might just be about the most perfect side of music ever laid down on an album. Side one cracks open with a garbled gush of subterranean homesick blues, his first hit single and an ever popular song of his. She Belongs to Me, probably about Joan Baez, shows Dylan as ambivalent to her, alternatively mocking and worshipful. The side's other love story, Love Minds Zero No Limits, is another perennially popular song and the first indication that Sarah Lowndes had entered Dylan's universe. Maggie's Farm is a brash, impertinent update of the Pentley Brothers down on Penny's Farm from 1929, with Dylan and his most murderously acerbic. The side ends with three wild rockers. Outlaw Blues, his tip of the hat to Sonny Boy Williamson. On the Road Again, the first in a series of increasingly hysterical put-downs of hipsters that dotted his mid-1960s output and the wild and funny 115th Dream, an electric version of Motorpsycho Nightmare, in which the current state of the American experiment is dissected and debated, a song which has a strange relevance even today. On side two, the story has it that Mr. Tambourine Man, The Gates of Eden and It's Alright Mara Moni Bleeding were recorded one after another, no second takes, not even a playback. Mr. Tambourine Man, written on a drunken night stargazing during a road trip from New York to New Orleans, is perhaps Dylan's most beloved song, charming and timeless of image and nimble of melody. It had been tried out for another side, but somehow distance of memory had burnished Dylan's performance and ingrained this song less as a clever string of symbols and more as a real and deeply personal experience for him. The Gates of Eden is, for the 1960s, a mid revolution in which was part supposedly authored by Dylan, a remarkably morally conservative song, a forebear of John Wesley Harding or Slow Train Coming, whereas the images of Mr. Tambourine Man are organic and naturalistic. On Gates of Eden they are abstruse, violent and deliberately grotesque. The same can be said for the dazzling stream of consciousness, It's Alright Mara, I'm Only Bleeding, one of Dylan's most popular and quotable songs. Concluding the album, we have the multi-level send-off song, It's All Over Now, Baby Blue, kissing off a lover, Joan Baez perhaps, or his old audience, each of his last three albums have concluded with a farewell song, Restless Farewell, It Ain't Me Babe, and this is the last song in his sequence but it's the cruelest and most definitive of them. Bringing it all back home is one of the two pillars that elevated the newborn rock music to the forefront of popular forms. And six months later, the other great pillar was to follow. Number two, Highway 61 Revisited, Dylan's hardest rocking album. From the almighty sonic wallop of Like a Rolling Stone and his fellow six minute bookend Tombstone Blues, to the supercharged blues of the title track, from the shivering paranoia of Ballad of a Thin Man, to a drug crazed wake up calling just like Tom Thumb's blues, from the philosophy in the dawn's early light of It Takes a Lot to Laugh, to the vivid hellscape of Desolation Row, Dylan threw together a remarkable band. Most praise goes to the guitarist Mike Bloomfield, an organist, even though he'd never played the organ before in his life, Al Cooper, but the playing of Harvey Brooks on bass and the ever-elegant Paul Griffin on piano cultivate a civilised edge to what is a raucous, almost reckless record. Drummer Bobby Gregg, although it's widely thought the Chicago great Sam Lay plays on the title track, does what Dylan felt he did best, hit the skins very hard indeed. The album effectively connects a mass audience raised on rock and roll to the hard sounds of blues, and it hardwired that sound in. Number one, 
Blonde on Blonde. The greatest rock album ever produced, barring nothing. Blonde on Blonde earns its place by the simplest of tricks. By taking everything that Dylan had done on his and the emerging rock music's previous high watermark, Highway 61 Revisited, and doing it twice as well. For the swirling and vicious like a rolling stone, we have the 3am flip side that is Visions of Joanna. From the raucous and bizarre Tombstone Blues, there's the raucous and loopy stuck inside of Mobile with the Memphis Blues again. The sweet and naturalistic It Takes a Lot to Laugh goes down a darker road to temporary like Achilles. Make your own comparisons. They're all there. That's not to say there's nothing new here. There are levels of intimate emotional complexity in I Want You, just like a woman, and particularly the album standout track for me, one of us must know sooner or later. There is an engagement with pop forms we haven't seen before in Absolutely Sweet Marie, Rainy Day Women 12 and 35, and it's the one album of his that you go to buy for the sheer moments of musical complexity that go beyond anything in Dylan's back pages. The arrangement on Just Like a Woman, the piano part on Sooner or Later, the butterfly delicacy of fourth time around. It's joyfully barely in control, ragged, manic and threadworn. It casts a pale over days and turns any time you listen to it into a cold night with the figurative coffee, cigarettes, and the questions that linger in the mists of your soul. Rock turned into other things after this. It got louder and freakier and artier and heavier. But it never got better. It never got vaster. It never became a thing which more closely ages with you from the first listen to 50 years later than it does here. <laughs> 